out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my brother and producer, Joel, here in the studio with me. And today, we are going to be covering the devil in the White City. Probably one of the most infamous figures in serial killing history, and that is H. H. Holmes. And to start off this episode, I just want to start off with a quote directly from him because I think it just really sets the tone for this whole episode. H. H. Holmes was quoted as saying, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world. And he has been with me since. Very interesting quote there. Yeah. I mean, anybody saying stuff like that is somebody you definitely want to watch out for. And yeah. Man, the, this is an absolutely crazy story. I mean, he's kind of a genius in his own evil way. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But before we get into the episode, I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for the support for the show. We've been super just blown away at the responses to the, especially the last couple episodes. Absolutely. It's just been really cool to see all your guys' feedback and, you know, love all the suggestions that you guys are sending us as well i mean there's so many cool things that we want to cover well not exactly cool things but (laughs) dark things that we want to cover interesting things so i'm very excited for what this uh future of this year holds for the show because we're going to get into a lot of different things uh that we didn't even think about uh last year but i also wanted to remind everybody that we do still have some merch available milehighmerch.com there's still some lights out logo merch out there so if you want some of that uh, hurry and go get it because it's almost sold out and we will not be restocking those designs so it's here and then it's gone forever so and i have to say i've been rocking this uh, lop dad cap for like i wear this every day and it's, <laughs> it's just so comfy it's a part of my uh my style now so that's cool that's yeah. really cool yeah no uh, it's really good stuff so if you haven't checked out the merch yet again that's milehiremerch.com but this episode is actually brought to you by purple care of and every plate Um, which is really awesome that we can actually get sponsors for content like this. I think that's pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Because, yeah, I mean, we're diving into some very evil, dark shit. So the fact that we still can get sponsored is uh, definitely cool. So without further ado, though, let's go ahead and get into H.H. Holmes. So H.H. Holmes, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't even realize is that it's not even his real name. That was a name that he actually gave himself later on in life. But he was actually born as Herman Webster Mudgett, which is not quite as uh, quite as I guess scary or terrifying to say as H. H. Holmes. I don't know. There's just something about H. H. Holmes that is just has a certain creepiness about it. But Herman Webster Mudgett, not so much. Right. The name Herman is kind of Herman. like a funny name. <laughs> Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So that's actually the name he was born with. And and throughout his life and in history, he's known by many, many names. The Devil in the White City is one. The Beast of Chicago. What we do know about H.H. H. Holmes is that he was one of America's first serial killers. And he might have even been the very first one. I mean, it's really hard to say exactly when he started killing. But he's definitely gone down in the history books by a bunch of evil names. But anyways... Herman Webster Mudgett, and I mean, we're going to be calling him H.H. Holmes throughout this and just probably by Holmes uh, just to make it easier. And plus, that's what we all know him as. But Herman was born on May 16th, 1861 in New Hampshire's Gilmanton Academy, which is a small remote farming village up there. And Holmes grew up in privilege. And the Mudgets were the first white settlers in this new township in 1761. And they happened to be a very wealthy family. And a lot of what we know about H.H. H. Holmes' childhood comes from him himself, and we do know that he was a pathological liar, and he told a lot of contradicting stories, so there's a lot of details that can't really be verified about his childhood, but what we do know is that his parents were devout Methodists. His mother was Theodate Page Price, and she was very cold and distant to him. She was also very strict with the religion and religious studies. His father, Levi Horton Mudgett, was a tough disciplinarian and an alcoholic, which those two together definitely does not make a good combination. But Holmes was likely the third of four siblings, but other accounts say he had two siblings. While his mother abused the kids emotionally, his father abused them physically. As punishment, they were isolated from the rest of the family 
and not given any food. So essentially starved. And if they were too loud, Holmes's father would put rags soaked in kerosene or I've even heard chloroform over their mouths. That's that's crazy to think about, like punishing your child that way. Like, yeah, that's wild. Basically poisoning twisted. them. Yeah. What? And rendering them unconscious, probably for a mistake they made. That's pretty. That's a pretty harsh upbringing. For sure. It seems like it could be fatal, too, if it's <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that. Imagine, you know, putting a gasoline rag over your child's mouth for too long. I mean, that's not going to end well. So in order to get away from his parents, Holmes would often run away into the woods nearby his house. And even as a small child, he was a very intelligent fella, and he liked to read Jules Verne and Edgar Allan Poe. He was very creative, and he came up with a lot of his own inventions. He also liked to hide things he liked in boxes, like a treasure chest. And his absolute favorite treasure was one of his own teeth. When he was a young boy, a local doctor forced him, I guess, to look at a skeleton in his office. When you're a young kid, and this absolutely terrified young Holmes. I mean, imagine that being, you know, eight, nine, even 10 years old. And your doctor's like, come look at this human. I mean, and this was not like some like science, you know, science yeah, like something you would see in the science classroom, right? No, this was a human skeleton just wow. like that the doctor had. Good God. So that's, that could be definitely traumatizing. Definitely. To a young child. Holmes was kind of an odd child. He rarely made eye contact with people. And unfortunately he was bullied relentlessly. When classmates found out that he was afraid of skeletons, they made him look at one hanging in their school and they would literally drag him into the room where the skeleton was and force him to be there. And obviously this was terrifying because he had that traumatic experience with the doctor Mm -hmm. earlier on. So he was, yeah, this was definitely traumatic for him. But later on, he described the skeleton as a grinning skeleton with outstretched arms ready to seize him kind of like the guy i got behind me huh (laughs) true that (laughs) my buddy who's always raising his hand yeah he's ready to turn the lights off (laughs) it's kind of it's kind of ironic that he's scared of skeletons meanwhile i have skeletons (laughs) all around me like right it's kind of funny we've even had some people mention that it's kind of spooked him out you know looking over your shoulder seeing a skeleton yeah it's kind of funny how he sits right behind me looking over my shoulder it's like my my buddy (laughs) And not only did these kids force him to just look at this grinning skeleton, but they also would take the skeleton's arms and hands and like put them over his face. And this just terrified him. I mean, he'd be screaming out loud. It was not a fun experience for him at all. But by facing this fear, you know, in a way they kind of helped him overcome it. And after this, he became absolutely obsessed with anatomy and the, you know, the human body. And because of it, he developed a very strong interest in medicine as he got older, he then started trapping animals in order to dissect them and perform amateur surgeries on them. He started out by dissecting small reptiles like lizards and snakes. And eventually he started catching larger animals like rabbits. And soon he was cutting open large mammals like dogs. When he was 11 years old, he went with his friend Tom to check out an abandoned house. Tom climbed onto a landing on the house and actually fell to his death. Holmes claimed that it was an accident, but many people suspected that he actually had pushed Tom off the ledge. So that could have even, I mean, for all we know, that could have been the first time that H.H. H. Holmes actually killed. Yeah, I have a strong suspicion he probably did push him off the ledge. So we don't have facts for that, though, unfortunately. But based on his patterns throughout his life, it would not surprise me if that mm-hmm. was his first kill. But at the age of 16, he actually graduated high school because he had an above average intelligence. And this was in 1877. And as a young man, he was very observant. And the slightest movement in a room would instantly catch his attention. One thing he didn't seem to understand, though, was personal space. He often stood too close, stared too long, and touched people for a very uncomfortable amount of time. But for whatever reason... Women seemed to be drawn to him. He was clever, charming, and smooth. And Philadelphia police detective Frank Geyer would later call him a social chameleon. That's a very interesting way to explain somebody. Yeah. It's really weird. And I I hate having to to say this, but like I I've always looked at myself as a social chameleon. Mm -hmm. As weird as that as I'm not trying to compare myself to H.T. Holmes right now, but just this his personality traits i feel like when i 
you know, learn about him. Like, I'm like, he sounds a lot like me, obviously not the things that happen to him, but just his personality and the way that, you know, he's able to adapt and get people to like him in any situation. I mean, I think we've talked about this before, but you know, growing up in my life, yeah, living I was in so say, many different places. I mean, oh, I've been yeah. to like 13 schools. You've been to more schools than me. Yeah. I mean, I've been to a lot of different situations and social environments where I've had to adapt and kind mm-hmm. of blend, blend you know? in with your surroundings right. and your so, the people. I would definitely consider myself a social chameleon. So it's yeah. interesting that he is a social chameleon. It's a cool way of saying it. It I, is. I haven't heard of that before. <laughs> yeah, it's a very cool term. I like that. It didn't take long for Holmes to start seeing a woman named Clara Lovering, who was a daughter of a wealthy farmer, and he wanted to marry her, partly because she was rich, but in order to marry her, he had to convince her family to give him consent. And apparently he did this very successfully because he ended up eloping on July 4th, 1878. And Holmes was just 17 years old at the time. And at first they had a great relationship. He always knew how to make Clara feel good. But after she got pregnant, he started losing interest. She gave birth to a baby boy named Robert Lovering Mudgett. But after his child was born, Holmes started leaving the house for long periods of time. And Clara had no idea where he was or what time he'd be back. In 1879, Holmes enrolled at the University of Vermont to study medicine, but he didn't like the curriculum, and he was tired of being a family man. And as a result of this, Holmes made the decision to leave his family and go attend the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor, which was known at the time for human dissection. It was also around this time that he started going by his new name, Henry Howard Holmes. Some people out there confuse that, you know, maybe he went by Holmes because of the famous Sherlock Holmes character, you know, that we all know and love, but that wasn't published until later on. So there would be no way for that to even be a connection. But for whatever reason, he chose H.H. Holmes and started going by that name in Illinois in 1886 in order to take a government test to practice pharmacy which is really wild to think about. You could just change your name and then go attend school and especially Mm -hmm. like pharmacy school. But I mean, this was the late 1800s. I mean, it was just a different time. It's hard to kind of wrap your head around that sometimes how different it was and how much easier it was to do things like go to school, you know, become a doctor, become a pharmacist and just change your name. If you want change your whole identity, if you want to. Yeah. That's literally what he's doing though is changing his whole identity. And who knows, maybe he was premeditating some things before he gets involved into his crimes because it's a good point he's going down the the pathway of like a morgue worker right like some like that well he wants to go dissect human bodies Mm -hmm. so you know under the medicine tent so getting all that experience right right so maybe he did have a master plan in his head of what he was going to do with his life and this was just you know the first steps and down that path but in medical school To no one's surprise, he didn't socialize much with classmates. He was usually very quiet and serious, and his peers thought he was strange but harmless. Holmes actually told people he planned to be a missionary in Zululand in South Africa, but this was a lie. Even though he had a natural talent for chemistry and anatomy, he was a mediocre medical student, as he was distracted by a side business of stealing cadavers and committing insurance fraud. He would actually take bodies and pieces of bodies from the laboratory at the medical school, which he would then use for his own medical experiments and just his own pure enjoyment. And what he would do is he would take these cadavers and then he would go out and take insurance policies out on them. Because back then the insurance game, I mean, it was like such a scam. It was so easy to like take insurance policies out and cash out on it. And so he took advantage. He saw, okay, here's a quick way to make money. I'll steal these corpses and take insurance policies out on these people and reap all the benefits. I mean, how sick is that? And the way that he would actually collect on the insurance money is that once he had the cadavers, he would burn and disfigure them, making it look like they died in accidents, and then he would go and collect his money. Which again, back then it was so much easier to get away with stuff like that. Obviously can't do that today. But, I mean, kind of a evil, you know, genius plan yeah. of his for sure. I mean, he found a way to play the system and just taken full-blown advantage of that. Exactly. And in one story, his landlady actually noticed a terrible smell coming from his room. 
She actually swept a dark object from under his bed with a broom one day and discovered it was a dead baby. He literally had a what the? cadaver of a baby under his bed that was just smelling. I mean, these are actual human bodies. Like, I don't even have words to describe how disgusting that is. You know? I know, I know. A Canadian classmate, though, sometimes worked to scam with him. One example of a scam they would run was by using a local family. Holmes and his accomplice talked a couple into taking out insurance policies on themselves and their young daughter. Then, Holmes would use his charm to convince them to leave town. And at that point, they stole three bodies matching their descriptions, mutilated them, and staged the accidental deaths. And when he worked with an accomplice, he would split the profits of the insurance payouts. So he would literally, like, have a couple... I mean, think about this for a minute. He would literally have a family... He'd convince them, you need to take out insurance policies is important. And then he would send them out of town. Then he would go get cadavers that look like them. Oh, my God. Fuck them up and then go collect. Say these guys accidentally died. We need to get paid on the insurance money. Wow. And he would get paid that way. It's just wild. That is. In another scam, Holmes and his accomplice were supposed to steal one body each. Holmes had his body, but his partner didn't follow through. So Holmes decided to put the stolen corpse in a barrel. And later he moved the barrel with him to Chicago and buried the bones in his basement. But he was all set to graduate medical school in 1884, but there was one problem. He had been seeing a widow who worked as a hairdresser and apparently promised to marry her. And after getting engaged, they consummated the marriage. But he backed out of the engagement and she sued him for breach of promise. In the 1800s, this was a very serious crime. And if he was found guilty, he would be expelled from medical school. This case went public. And as a result, his classmates and professors were stunned. And this behavior just seemed very unlike, you know, the person that Holmes was portraying to the rest of his classmates, you know, quiet, kept to himself, harmless. Basically having a mask on, you know. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. And luckily, one of his professors, Professor Herdman, actually defended Holmes against the expulsion consequence that the school board was trying to hand down. And he was subsequently allowed to graduate in June 1884. But after the graduation ceremony, Holmes told Professor Herdman that the widow wasn't lying. He had promised to marry her, consummated the marriage, and backed out. And later on, Professor Herdman wrote, This was the first positive evidence I had received up until that time, that the fellow was a scoundrel, and I told him so at the time. He also later learned that Holmes had tried to rob his house twice while in medical school. So the very professor (laughs) that is defending holmes holmes was literally gonna try to rob him (laughs) wow so after school for the next few years holmes moved around the country taking random jobs including working as a teacher and a doctor some of his students said he showed them a severed foot during class and others heard rumors that he had a secret wife who disappeared he was actually suspected in the disappearance of a young boy while he was in new york and in the death of another boy in philadelphia yet he denied he had anything to do with either case. While working as a doctor, Holmes shared an office with another doctor named Steely. One patient, a dying Civil War vet, asked the doctors to do an autopsy after he died to make sure his wife got his military pension. So after he passed, Holmes removed the bullet from his chest where he was shot in the war. He also removed his shattered ribs and refused to give the evidence for his cause of death to Steely unless he paid him. So holding this poor dude's body parts ransom, essentially. Steely didn't need the ribs and refused to pay Holmes. And as far as anyone knows, Holmes kept this dude's ribs. And before he left town, he borrowed money from Steely for a train ticket to Chicago. And once he left, he never returned and he never paid Steely back. Holmes arrived in the Chicago area in 1886. He liked living in a larger city because his personality quirks went unnoticed. He also enjoyed being near the stockyards where animals were kept before being taken to the slaughterhouse. He got a job working in a pharmacy located on 63rd and Wallace in Englewood near Jackson Park. And it was at this time that he started going by the name Dr. H. H. Holmes. The pharmacy he worked at was owned by a couple. And for a while, the story was that Dr. E. S. Holton, an old man, owned the pharmacy. But it was later discovered that Dr. Elizabeth Sarah Holton was a young woman who was pregnant when Holmes arrived. Her husband, Mr. Holton, was older and in poor health. And after Holmes started working there, Mr. Holton mysteriously disappeared. 
Elizabeth was happy to turn over the pharmacy's responsibilities to Holmes and eventually sold the building to him. And soon after that, she disappeared as well. And Holmes told people in the neighborhood she just moved to California. Some believe that Holmes actually killed the couple, while others think they were actually alive and, you know, just living in a different part of the city. While owner of the pharmacy, he ran several different schemes. One was pretty successful. He sold a mineral water elixir that he claimed had healing properties, but it was really just tap water, and people bought it up. You know what Holmes is? He's a straight up hustler. Yep. H.H. H. Holmes the Hustler, man. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's another name for him. A dirty hustler, dirty line hustler. Uh-huh. Yeah. Running all these scams. He would also swindle money from the employees at the drugstore. So he's just lying, cheating, stealing everywhere he went. I mean, he's a sneaky bastard, that's for sure. Definitely. And he's only 26 years old at this point in his life. And he's kind of, you know, established himself as a rich, eligible bachelor and a very handsome young man. According to those that knew him, he had dazzling blue eyes that seemed to hypnotize any young woman he met. So it didn't take long for him to meet his next wife, Murda Belknap, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Holmes actually bought her parents a house in order to persuade them to consent to their marriage. On January 28th, 1887, they had a ceremony, but it wasn't legal. He had filed for divorce from Clara, claiming she had cheated on him, but it had never gone through. Despite all this, they still had a child together, and Murder gave birth to a baby girl named Lucy Holmes. Following his usual pattern, though, he got tired of Murder shortly after their daughter was born. So he started living at his office and rarely went home to see his family. And using the money from all these various scams and schemes he ran, he bought an empty lot across the street from the pharmacy. And there are contradicting stories on whether or not there was already a building on that land or if Holmes actually built one from scratch. Some say there was a building, some say that he built the building. But what we do know is he designed the structure himself. Supposedly, the blueprint came to him like a vision. And in 1889, H.H. Holmes built a three-story hotel between 601 and 603 West 63rd Street, and he called it the Castle. He hired and fired so many crews that he became the only person that actually knew everything there was to know about this building. He would hire someone to come in and build one piece, like a wall or a staircase, but then he would fire them. And when they wanted to be paid, he'd refuse, claiming that they did shitty work. During construction, he bought a huge asbestos-lined bank vault on credit and built the hotel around it. Yet he never paid for the vault, and when he was threatened with repossession, he told them to come and get it. But he warned that if any part of his building was damaged, he'd sue. So no one actually ever came for the vault. Interesting. It's like Holmes is playing chess because he's a few steps ahead of, you know, he is. avoiding. He's, he's really an evil genius. Uh-huh. I mean, he's obviously very intelligent and knows how to manipulate people. Very good. And take it. advantage of the system. I mean, he's obviously knows the ins and outs of the insurance business, the, you know, credit and all that to just take advantage of it. And I think people are kind of low key scared of him too at this point. Uh-huh. I think people are starting to wonder about this guy. Like people are disappearing around yeah, you. Yeah, they're hearing stories. Yeah. It's like fishy. So definitely. What's crazy is that nobody even knows the full design of this hotel he built. Some of the stories come from firsthand accounts or later police investigations. And many come from news stories in the 1890s. But what we do know is that Holmes was basically building a house of horrors. Which reminds me of uh, Madame LaLaurie yep. and her whole thing too. Yep, very similar, but way worse as you'll see. The first floor was completely normal looking with several businesses including a pharmacy, jewelry store, barber shop, restaurant, and a blacksmith shop. And he built living quarters on the top floor. The hotel's second floor was an elaborate, confusing maze with fake elevator shafts, false walls, and trap doors. And it would later become 35 rooms that were built for chaos, torture, and murder, earning this hotel the nickname The Murder Castle. Hallways and staircases went nowhere. Secret passages hidden behind walls led from room to room. There were soundproof rooms and doors that could only be locked from the outside. 
Holmes made sure anyone who came in would never be able to find their way out. In a secret hiding place behind a wall, there was a peephole looking into an airtight room. The hiding place had a gas valve that filled the room with gas and asphyxiated anyone inside. What's crazy is that this murder castle literally sounds like a Saw movie. Uh-huh. Pretty much. It's, I was it's about very to say similar that, yeah. to, to that whole you know premise of all these traps and rooms and stuff. Definitely. I mean, you don't really hear about killers doing this type of stuff very often, but H.H. H. Holmes literally built this hotel to kill people oh yeah like and 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 it was like a game to him Uh you know he was like let's play a game for sure (laughs) that's hh holmes right there yeah well looking at the pictures of uh what the layout looks like i mean this does look like a very intimidating place to be because play you know doors lead nowhere it's like once you're inside you're basically trapped yeah and you know torture takes place I'm, i'm i'm sure there's all these places that you could potentially die but this hotel also had greased chutes large enough to fit a body, which led to the basement where there was a kiln to, in order to cremate human remains. The basement also had body-sized tanks of acid, dugout pits filled with quicklime, a dissecting table, and a stretching rack. So a medieval torture chamber, essentially. So the way that he set up his dissecting table was so that he could actually drain a body of its blood strip off the flesh and he was left with nothing but organs and a skeleton which he then could sell to medical schools because during this time there was a cadaver shortage so as long as faces were disfigured enough he could get away with selling intact corpses for a nice profit so again like this is just the time period it was you know something that they just did and there's no way to really, there's not like a registry. There's no way to actually track who these people are that mm. are becoming medical cadavers. I mean, they still use cadavers today, but obviously they're tracked and it's not just random bodies being brought in. You, yeah. know, you have to donate your body to science. You know, you hear about people doing that. You're essentially allowing yourself to become a cadaver for medical students and stuff. I mean, it's important that people are able to study the human bodies, mm-hmm. but you know you shouldn't just be able to bring in like some mutilated corpse no. and be like hey i'll how much you want for that like right well it <laughs> trying makes trying to sell it makes me think like how is he persuading these people that this is yeah. an actual like truthful right. death well he's just that convincing i guess wow he's super i mean he's super smart he knows how to just kind of talk over everybody he knows how to convince oh yeah his persuasion has to be like so good top notch yeah I mean, top notch to be able to get to this point even you have to be able to fool people into thinking you're a doctor yeah for and so sure. and back and then, he had the title right. doctor you know so people just bought it i guess back then nobody like verified anything there's no internet to <laughs> yeah. really check people out so you kind of just took people at their word right and so he was like i'm dr hh H. holmes mm-hmm. here's the cadaver I, you know they yeah. died from an accidental fall or something exactly. and yet the reality is he would had them down in his fucking dissecting table ripping them apart to then make money off of i mean it's so dark like yeah yeah so in addition to this hotel holmes still owned the building across the street and still ran the pharmacy in 1890 a jeweler named ned connor moved in with his wife julia and their daughter pearl holmes offered to sell ned the building including the pharmacy and he agreed as he was excited to start a new chapter with his family But Ned had no idea how much debt the pharmacy was in. And when he bought that building, all that debt was transferred to him. Another premeditated decision by H.H. Holmes. I mean, he knew. He's like, eventually this ship's going to sink. And I I better not be on it. So he gave it. He was like, here, take it, Ned. And now Ned's fucked. Right. (laughs) There's no disclosure of of what, you know, what debt he had. Just crazy, you know. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. And obviously Ned was pissed that Holmes misled him. And he was furious when he found out that Holmes was also sleeping with his wife, Julia. Oh my God. He's, he's a, just a fucking snake. Like he, oh, he's that's that a great guy way of putting it. Yeah. He's, you know, he slithered his way in there and not only did he fuck you over, but uh-huh. now he's fucking your wife too. Like he's that kind of fucking guy. It's just wild. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately Ned's marriage never recovered from this affair and they eventually got divorced, which at the time was very rare and pretty scandalous to do that. Ned then sold the store back to Holmes and moved away. Soon after, Julia and Pearl 
disappeared. The people in the neighborhood wanted to know what happened to them, and Holmes said that they were just visiting family and would be back. But Julie and Pearl were never seen again. And it's crazy to think that's what Holmes told everybody. And he somehow was like in contact with him and, you know, told him a similar story. But I would think family would have like, I don't know if they had phones back then, but I was this is is pre-phone. Is it all letters? Pre-phone, yeah. Like telegraph and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So communication, I mean, there's not that open lines of communication. Like now, you know, it's very hard to get away with this. But back then, I Mm. mean, everything takes way longer for news to travel. So it's a lot easier to fool people. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense why word of mouth was so like, that's all they really had then. Yeah. It seems like so. Well, and there's no proof either. Like they yeah. can't prove that he had anything to do with their disappearance. They just disappeared. Mm-hmm. So, and he's a doctor. So, you know, he's got to be a good guy then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Right. That makes sense. But I'm sure there's people that were starting to wonder about him. Like, where are these people going? Why are they all disappearing? Yeah. I would, I would feel like something wouldn't feel right around him. You right. Know? Yeah, exactly. But in 1891, construction on the hotel was finally completed. And Holmes started advertising jobs and rooms for rent in the local papers, specifically looking for young women. And at the same time, he also took out personal advertisements that said he was a wealthy man looking to get married and settle down. Literally, would like put himself in the paper. Be like, I'm the eligible bachelor. Come women to me. And in order to make this whole situation even more enticing, he filled his hotel with elaborate, beautiful furniture to make it even more appealing. And he bought all that furniture on credit with no intention of ever paying off the debt. He required anyone who worked at the hotel or stayed there to take out a life insurance policy. He paid the premiums and they named him as the beneficiary. Holmes frequently got engaged to young women who came through the hotel and required them to have insurance policies as well. Like... (sighs) that's not suspicious at all Uh like hi nice to meet you do you have any insurance policy on your life yeah you're gonna need one if you want to be with me and and talk about a serious topic to bring up immediately that's an immediate red flag to me you know yeah yeah. i I guess he was a really handsome guy for these women to be like okay you know just disregard that and he did exactly what you're what you're probably thinking these people that would come through these women that would come through would vanish without a trace and he would go and collect on the insurance money Because he was the beneficiary. And after this happening for some time, people in the neighborhood became suspicious of Holmes. They wanted to know why they saw people go into the castle, but never come out. And eventually they reported it to the authorities. But the authorities didn't really do anything because there's no proof. So nothing really ever came out of their investigations. One of the employees of the hotel was a beautiful young woman named Emmeline Sigrand. And she was a skilled typist and secretary, and Holmes offered to double her salary to leave her job in order to come work for him at the hotel. His real intentions, though, were to start a sexual relationship, and they tried to keep their affair a secret. But everyone seemed to know that they were sleeping together. And in December of 1882, a woman staying at the hotel named Mrs. Lawrence saw Emmeline and stopped the chat. Emmeline gave her an early Christmas gift and implied that she'd be leaving Chicago before the holiday. And Mrs. Lawrence asked if she was quitting her job at the hotel. And when she asked this, Emmeline seemed uncomfortable and said maybe. And right after this encounter, Emmeline disappeared. Mrs. Lawrence was obviously suspicious, and she knew that something wasn't right. So she went to Holmes and asked about Emmeline. Where'd she go? And he just claimed that Emmeline had left to marry her fiance. And all of this was news to Mrs. Lawrence, as she thought Emmeline would have mentioned an upcoming marriage and a honeymoon the last time that they had talked. But Holmes insisted and showed her a wedding card, which was typed instead of written, which was the style at the time. Mrs. Lawrence wasn't convinced. And later, he showed her a clipped out announcement of the wedding of Emmeline Sigrand and Robert Phelps. And it read, The bride, after completing her education, was employed as a stenographer in the county recorder's office. From here, she went to Dwight, and there from Chicago, where she met her fate. What? Yeah, what? I mean, Mrs. Lawrence was like, what what are you talking about? Met her fate. Very, very weird. Uh Uh-huh. Shortly after, she saw Holmes with two associates, Benjamin Pitzel and Patrick Quinlan moving a heavy trunk from the hotel. 
and she believed that Emmeline's body was inside. But obviously she was never able to prove that that was actually Emmeline's. But Benjamin Pitzel came to Chicago with his family in the fall of 1889, and he had been traveling around the Midwest for 10 years working labor jobs to support his wife Carrie and their five children. Desi was the oldest at 17, and then Alice, Nellie, and Howard, and their last infant son was named Wharton. Benjamin Pitzel had been arrested a few times for small crimes like forgery and robbery, and life was hard, and he coped by drinking too much. But he was a committed husband and father. And in Chicago, he responded to a job ad from Holmes for a carpenter. And together, they became partners in crime. Within a few years, Holmes had gotten very close to Benjamin's family. He enjoyed being around the kids, and he was soon thought of as one of the family. And in 1893, a huge opportunity came up. Chicago was hosting the World's Fair called at the time the Columbian Exposition. It was an event to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. So it was a really big deal. And just like the Olympics does, the World Fair really transformed the city in order to accommodate millions of guests that would be flocking to the fair. From May to October, 27 million people traveled from all over the world to see the exhibits. There was the world's first Ferris wheel, a 1,500-pound chocolate statue, and the first gas-powered motor car to ever be seen in the U.S. The most famous architects in the world designed exhibits from over 40 countries, including Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed New York Central Park. Luckily for Holmes, the World's Fair was just a short distance from his hotel, and there was about to be literally millions of people there looking for somewhere to stay. And he called his hotel the World's Fair Hotel, and planned to start advertising as soon as the fair began. He's like, this is the perfect yeah, place jackpot. I can go fishing, you know? Jackpot. Yeah. So it's thought that Holmes and Pitzel may have attracted guests to swindle just through word of mouth. And at various times, Holmes ran multiple side businesses from the hotel that were all scams. He sold a cure for alcoholism, ran a copy machine business, and operated a glass bending studio. Yet he never really did much glass bending in that studio. But his main money-making schemes involved insurance fraud, selling body parts, or a combination of both. All the fabulous furniture that he bought, you know, in order to make his hotel look nice, were never paid for and eventually were repossessed. During the fair on August 13th, 1893, there was a fire that destroyed the third floor of the hotel. And Holmes received a generous insurance payout, giving him more investment capital for the hotel. And he was actually briefly arrested after the fire on suspicion of insurance fraud, but he was never charged and soon released. Because as you can probably imagine, that man probably set his own hotel ablaze in order to get that insurance money. Because it was so easy to cash out on insurance money that he, and he knew that. So why not burn your third Mm -hmm. story? You know, if you need money in order to, you know, keep doing whatever you're doing, then why not collect? Right. And if he needed to burn anything inside there too, that could be another way to conceal and then restart again. Right. Exactly. Know? Maybe he was like, I need to get rid of the evidence yeah. of the murders I have committed in here in order to make way for more. Uh huh. I mean, it's so obvious that H.H. H. Holmes just had everything like premeditated. Like he Definitely. really thought long and hard about this whole plan and this whole schemes that he was running. I mean, he really thought through all of it real well. Basically like a criminal mastermind yep. that can outsmart law enforcement or whatever, anybody. Everybody, yeah. yeah. And after this happened, once again, stories of out-of-town guests entering his hotel and never leaving continued to spread throughout the neighborhood. Now, before we get into some more graphic details about H.H. H. Holmes' murder castle, I want to thank our sponsors for today. <coughs> Today's first sponsor is Purple. Throw some bedding on a bunch of different mattresses and sure, they might all look alike. The same goes for pillows, but peel away the layers and look at what's inside. And you'll see that they aren't all created equal. And that's what makes every Purple pillow and mattress unlike anything you've ever slept on before. The Purple Grid sets the Purple mattress apart from every other mattress. It's a patented comfort technology that instantly adapts your body's natural shape and sleep style. With over 1,800 open-air channels designed to neutralize body heat, Purple provides a cooling effect other mattresses can't replicate. I don't know about you, but I gotta be cool when I sleep, otherwise I sleep like shit. But this cutting-edge technology doesn't stop with the mattresses. 
Every purple pillow is engineered with the grid for total head and neck support and absolute airflow, so you're always on the cool side of the pillow. And right now, you can try every purple product risk free with free shipping and returns. Plus, purple has financing available at 0% APR for qualified customers. So, experience the purple grid today and you'll sleep like never before. Go to purple.com slash lights out 10 and use promo code lights out 10. For a limited time, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash lights out 10, promo code lights out 10 for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Terms apply. One of the things I've been trying to do this year is try to eat healthier, be healthier overall, get better sleep. Also, give my body the vitamins and supplements that it needs. And I don't know about you, but every time I've gone to the vitamin section of any store, I'm always lost. There's a million different options. You never know what you need, you know, what your body actually needs. Because, I mean, you know, sometimes vitamins are expensive and sometimes, you know, you don't want to buy all these vitamins if you don't know exactly what your body needs. But that's when Care Of came into the picture. And Care Of is awesome because they have this online quiz. It's approximately five minutes to complete and it asks you a ton of questions about your diet, lifestyle, health concerns you might have, or just wellness goals. And what it does is it pairs you up with the actual vitamins and supplements your body actually needs and nothing else. And I love the fact that they come in little packs. You know, they're already, you know, you're basically your daily dose of your vitamins are all ready for you. You just take the little pack. It's got your name on it. You peel it open and you take your vitamins. It's super easy, super convenient, and it's on a schedule. So you never go without them, which is really nice. It's kind of a set it and forget it type of thing. And right now, Carev is offering a special offer. You can get 50% off your first Carev order. Go to takecareof.com and enter code lightsout 50 Again, you can get 50% off your first Carev order. If you go to takecareof.com and enter code LIGHTSOUT50. And our last sponsor for today is Every Plate. I absolutely love Every Plate because they make meal time super easy. I have a very busy schedule. I have a lot going on, so it's very difficult for me to find the time to plan out meals, go to the grocery store, get the ingredients I need. I oftentimes buy way too much food, end up wasting food. And with Every Plate, it's really nice because they just send you all the ingredients pre-measured right to your door with the recipes that only take about 30 minutes to do. And they are some delicious food. I mean, some of the best pasta I've eaten, no joke, has been from every plate. Plus, all of their produce is super fresh. I've never had any issues with spoiled foods or any issues with, you know, the quality. Everything is top notch and ready to be deliciously devoured. And who doesn't love to eat a delicious home cooked meal? And why not take the stress out of the process by having every plate deliver everything you need for those meals right to your door? What's great about every plate is that it is definitely the most affordable meal kit that's out there. And that doesn't mean you're going to get a lower quality of food. You just get a better deal. And right now you can try every plate for just $1.99 per meal, plus an additional 20% off your next two boxes by going to everyplate.com and entering code lights out 199. Again, get started with every plate for just $1.99 per meal, plus an additional 20% off another two weeks by going to everyplate.com and entering code lights out one nine nine. All right. So we were talking about HH Holmes murder castle, and this is where things start to get very disturbing. So as you probably know, the murder castle had no shortage of ways to torture and kill anyone who entered based on how it was built. Holmes didn't actually kill people face to face. Instead, he asphyxiated them with gas or left them in the bank vault to die of hunger and thirst. He preferred to slowly torture people from afar and watch them slowly die. The peepholes and secret passageways he had gave him plenty of areas to watch people panic and then grow weaker and weaker until they passed. He wasn't a particularly strong man, but he favored women as his victims and usually used his charm in order to get them into the hotel. And after somebody died in his hotel, the bodies were easily disposed of whether it was in his kiln, his acid tubs, or lime pits. And while on business in Boston, Holmes met Minnie Williams. She was plain, but easily manipulated. Minnie was an orphan and had inherited a small fortune. She was expecting to inherit even more money soon after her elderly guardian died. Holmes introduced himself as Howard Gordon and got to work right away. He seduced Minnie, 
and convinced her to sign over control of her finances and real estate holdings to him. After that, she moved to Chicago and Holmes married her in a sham ceremony, as there's no record of the marriage anywhere, and he was still legally married to his first wife. Minnie's father died when she was young, and her and her sister Nanny, also called Annie sometimes, were raised by relatives. Nanny lived in Alabama and the sisters had drifted apart, other than the occasional letter. When Minnie mentioned her new husband, Nanny dropped everything and traveled to Chicago to meet this charming, handsome doctor who had married her rather boring sister. And at the time, the World's Fair was still happening, and Holmes took the women out to see all the sights and sounds, as this was one of the only times Holmes actually attended the fair. Nanny actually didn't think Holmes was all that handsome, but he won her over with his generosity and charm. Soon after Nanny arrived, she actually disappeared. Afterwards, Holmes took Minnie and Benjamin Pitzel to Fort Worth, Texas, so Minnie could sign over the rest of her family land to him. Benjamin helped Holmes build a new structure there that matched the castle exactly, basically a second murder castle. Holmes borrowed from multiple banks for the project and, of course, never paid back a penny. He used the project to launder money and then left Texas before the creditors could ever catch up to him. After this trip, though, Minnie disappeared just like her sister, Nanny. Anyone who thought they saw Minnie after this was actually seeing Patrick Quinlan's wife, who Holmes paid to impersonate her. The bodies of Minnie and Nanny were never found, and there's no record of their deaths. They just literally disappeared off the face of the planet. After the World's Fair ended, Chicago's economy suffered, and Holmes decided it was time to go. For a while, he ran multiple insurance scams to make money. One of his most lucrative schemes was stealing horses in Texas and sending them to St. Louis to sell. But he was actually caught in Colorado, arrested and charged with fraud. And he spent the rest of 1893 in jail. But he was eventually released in January of 1894. And soon after, he met his next wife, Georgiana Yoki. Though he seemed to be addicted to marriage, Holmes never did finalize a divorce, so he wasn't actually like, officially married to any of these women but they still got married on january 17th 1894 in denver colorado wow hh H. holmes actually ran through our our town at yeah one point. that's wild that is. this time he used the name mr h m howard he then told georgiana that his wealthy uncle had left him land which was actually minnie's land on the condition that he took his name h m howard and apparently she bought the story Meanwhile, Benjamin Pitzel had moved his family to St. Louis, and Holmes contacted him about a money-making scheme. The plan was for Benjamin to take out a life insurance policy on himself for $10,000, fake his death, and then Holmes would collect the payout and split it with him. They agreed that Holmes would provide the body. So they planned to meet in Philadelphia, and Benjamin told his wife Carrie the plan before he left. He then waited in Philadelphia for Holmes to find a body, And to pass the time, he drank, and one night, Holmes drank with him and egged him on to take more and more shots. And once Benjamin had passed out from all the alcohol, Holmes gave him a lethal dose of chloroform. He then used an oil lamp to singe off his hair and clothes, and he smashed the chloroform bottle on the floor to make it look like he died in an accidental explosion. The coroner didn't buy it, though. Yeah, that's an accidental explosion, like... Come on now. But he killed his own friend. He right. killed his own, like his only Backstabbed friend and business him. partner. Just yeah. was like, he was never planning to actually collect the body. He was just going to use his body. Right. And then he ends up killing him, taking all the money. You know, that reminds me of Batman, the dark Knight, and how the first scene at the bank, how there it's like six of them together. And then at the end, it's right. just the Joker. Cause everyone else Shoots all gets the rest planned to die. Yeah. That's kind of something like yeah. that. You it's know? that type of mentality. Yeah. Of like, just ruthlessness he's in it only for himself only for myself and yeah even though i like pretended to like you and your family and your kids like i don't care about any of you Mm -hmm. i mean he's just that that savage so when holmes got back to st louis he was actually arrested for fraud while in jail he met marion hedgepeth and introduced himself as hm howard marion was a career criminal and he agreed to help holmes get the insurance payout for benjamin's death and in return marion would get 500 dollars of the payout so he could hire a lawyer. Holmes was only in jail for a short time. When he was released, he moved to Philadelphia to open a fake patent office. Holmes told Carrie and Benjamin's kids that Benjamin was still alive 
and he was still moving forward with the scheme. He actually talked Benjamin's wife into sending one of their kids to travel with him as he needed someone to identify Benjamin's body. So Carrie sent her 15-year-old daughter, Alice, to meet him by train. So basically a child. Yeah. Like, she's all the while believing that Benjamin's actually faking his own death, like, is playing along. Meanwhile, she just sent her daughter to go be with the man that just murdered her husband. It's crazy. It is. Once Alice met up with Holmes, he then brought her to the coroner's office to take a look at the blackened corpse of her father. And she was able to identify him by his teeth. And in her mind, I mean, she's thinking that oh, this is just some fake body, you know, and she's being like, oh, because like, think about it. Like if a body is just figure you can't can't identify it physically, then you're just going to go by the teeth and her as a 15 year old daughter. You're really going to know what your father's teeth look like. No. So it was clearly just set up so that she would go in there and just be like, oh, yeah, that's him. Uh huh. Thinking that it wasn't really him because he faked his own death, sure. according to what Holmes had told him, but in reality, it was really her father. After Holmes got the insurance money for Benjamin, he then told Carrie that Benjamin owed him $5,000 and that he needed to pay off his debt, so he was going to keep that money, and she obviously agreed. She's like, okay, let's pay off the debt. At this point in time, Holmes also felt like that Benjamin's family knew too much about him and what was going on. So he told Carrie that Benjamin was hiding out in Cincinnati and asked her to send two more kids to travel there with him. So Carrie sent her 11-year-old daughter Nellie and 8-year-old son Howard to join Alice. Desi and baby Wharton stayed with her, and the three of them planned to travel to meet Benjamin later. And during this time, Holmes had reoccurring nightmares of Benjamin's rotting corpse. Seems like subconsciously that guilt might have been eating away at him. That's what I was thinking. For murdering his close friend. Because I think he really was his friend. Yeah. He felt something for him, you know? And I think he kind of realizes after the fact when it's too late that oh, man, maybe I shouldn't have killed this guy. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, could he have been perhaps the only real friend I've ever had? Yeah. And I just murdered him and stole from him. And now I have his children by my side. Like, Right. Because it's it's so, like, odd because, in a sense, he has so many other victims to choose from, but why would he pick someone that close to him? I mean, it seems like he's slightly desperate. From he knew it was a surefire way to get money he needed. Yeah, true. And that. so he he was willing, you know, to sacrifice his friend in order to keep himself going and keep his plan rolling, which is just so fucked up. But because in a sense, his friend being that close to him, he knew is like an easy kill. Like that was yeah. I mean, it was super. He trusted him. Yeah. If somebody trusts in you, they immediately become the easiest target. Right. Because they're, the last thing they're thinking is that you're going to fucking gonna kill murder me yeah. and then steal from me. Right. So I have no doubts that he probably had some nightmares that were, you know, because of that very guilt that he was feeling. But from September 28th to November 17th, 1894, he traveled with his wife, Georgiana, and Benjamin's three kids while keeping close tabs on Carrie and the other two as they traveled to meet them. They traveled through the Midwest and Canada, including Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Detroit, Toronto, and Ogdensburg, New York. And every time he met up with Carrie's group, he claimed she had just missed Benjamin before he went off to another city. Before they arrived in Detroit, Alice wrote a letter to her mother that she never received that said, Howard is not with us. Holmes had already killed him and disposed of the body, and the girls were next. Alice missed her mother and baby brother, and she claimed that she was homesick. She had no idea that her mom and brothers were actually in the same city just three blocks away. So after killing Howard, the poor little boy of Benjamin, Holmes kept the two groups apart. Alice and Nellie were last seen at a rental house in Toronto. Holmes killed them and buried their bodies in the basement of the house. When Carrie arrived in Vermont to meet Holmes, he tried to talk her into letting him take the other two kids, but Carrie refused. Holmes went into the basement and dug a hole, and he left her a note telling her to go into the basement. When Carrie went down into the basement, she nearly avoided falling into the hole and just missed stepping on a bottle of an explosive substance. And at this point, she was convinced that H.H. Holmes had tried to kill her. Fidelity Mutual Insurance, which paid out Benjamin's life insurance policy, was always suspicious of Holmes and Benjamin. Marion Hedgepath, his prison confidant, was angry 
that he was cut out of the deal and actually told the police the whole entire plan. And Holmes, maybe sensing the end was near, went back to New Hampshire and briefly reunited with his parents, his first wife Clara and his now 15-year-old son Robert. He told his family that he had been in an accident eight years ago and had completely lost his memory, and that the hospital actually gave him the name H.H. Holmes. After he fell in love with Georgiana and married her, his memory of his real family returned, and they believed the whole story. That's crazy. I mean, the fact that he's just so convincing, he'd be like, yeah, I just lost my mind, and they gave me another name, so I, well, here I am. I just remembered who I actually who I actually am. Surprise, uh-huh. I'm back. Like, And the fact that everybody just believes this man is just right. so crazy. And I, I get the impression that his story kind of changes a lot, too. Like he's always having to like he's a pathological liar, so uh-huh. he fits the narrative to what he needs at that point in time. But right, he's also thinking about you know the long term, the too. big picture of right. How I got to they... make sure that these lies come back and fall uh-huh. back in line and make sense, right? Because there is going to be a point where people are going to question me, and I need to be able to explain in detail and depth, right? And... What actually happened, mm-hmm. and I don't know, blaming it on an accident seems pretty convenient. Uh huh. Shortly after reuniting with his family, he then fled to Boston and left a note that he'd be back. And it looked like he might be preparing to flee the country. The police tracked him there, and he was arrested for an outstanding warrant in Texas for stealing horses on November 17, 1894. Philadelphia police detective Frank Geyer was searching for Benjamin Pitzel's missing children, and he suspected Holmes had killed Benjamin and the kids. And by now, this was a national story. Detective Geyer described Holmes as having moral insanity and later called him a psychopath. He was convicted for insurance fraud, but the authorities knew there was more to his crimes. Kerry Pitzel was also arrested and convicted on fraud charges. And it didn't take long for the Chicago police to eventually find their way to Holmes' hotel, where they did a full search. And what they found was extremely shocking. There was a tank of gasoline for stripping flesh from bone, a furnace to cremate bodies, a scratched bench covered in bloodstains that was used to dissect corpses, and a rope inside a toolbox in order to hang people from the fake elevator shaft. The police found dismembered, decomposing bodies in the basement and bones preserved in quicklime. There were so many pieces of bodies that they had no way of knowing how many people were actually down there. There were body parts of men, women, and children. They pieced together the remains of a child about 8 to 10 years old that they believed was Pearl Connor. Holmes admitted to covering up Julia's death, claiming she died during a botched abortion. He said he murdered Pearl because she was a witness. When they searched the stove, they found pieces of fabric and a watch chain that had belonged to Minnie Williams. Holmes claimed the bones were just cadavers he had buried and denied murdering anyone. Throughout this process, though, he changed the story multiple times. He said Benjamin had killed himself, but he made it look like an accident in order to get insurance money. He said all the kids were alive and well with Minnie Williams, and she probably took them to London by now. But he did confess to murdering 27 people across the U.S. and Canada. At this point, the police in Indianapolis and Toronto joined the investigation. Detective Geyer worked with an inspector from Fidelity Mutual Insurance to check hotel records, boarding houses, and rental properties anywhere Holmes might have stayed with the kids. And it wasn't long before they tracked down the rental house in Toronto. And in the basement, they found freshly dug dirt and discovered a large trunk that Carrie had packed for the girls. And inside this trunk were the naked bodies of Alice and Nellie. When they asked Holmes about it, he claimed he locked Nellie and Alice in the trunk and killed them by running a pipe from the gas line into it. Howard Pitzel's body was found in a shallow grave at one of his Indianapolis properties alongside bottles of cyanide and wolfsbane. Meanwhile, as police officers and reporters searched the murder castle, a candle set off fumes from a fuel tank and caused an explosion. And when Holmes heard the bodies were found, he said, well, I suppose they'll hang me for this. Investigators discovered a stove that Holmes had installed at a property in Indianapolis, He had tried to install a similar stove in Ohio before a neighbor got suspicious, and so he gave her the stove and fled. In Indianapolis, they found burned pieces of cloth, photo, several human teeth, and the top of a skull of a young boy. And once the media started learning all the details, everyone freaked the fuck out. All the people who knew Holmes, stayed at the hotel, or worked there suddenly realized how close they had come to being murdered. A man named Myron Chappell 
came forward and told police that he had helped Holmes sell skeletons to medical schools and dispose of bodies. But this story was proven to be a lie as Myron's son said he was a crazy drunk. But this threw off the investigation so much that the police stopped interviewing witnesses and stopped searching Holmes' properties to avoid another embarrassing mistake. So no one knows how many stories still remain unknown. Eventually, H.H. Holmes confessed to killing more than 200 people, including Benjamin, Alice, and Nellie Pitzel. But some of the people he said he killed were actually still alive. Some he just called the wrong name. Investigators suspect he killed a girl named Emily Van Tassel, but in his confession, Holmes called her Anna Van Tassad, or Rosine Van Tassand. His changing stories and inconsistencies made it impossible to discover the truth, and Holmes never admitted to murdering Emmeline Sagrand, Minnie Williams, or Nanny Williams. But there was a footprint in the vault that the police believe was left by Nanny or Emmeline. So literally, he'd put people in the vault, lock them in there till they died of starvation. I mean, every possible way you could torture somebody, H.H. H. Holmes' murder castle had that torture device. And I was going to say, I can't imagine how hard it was for law enforcement or whoever came inside his house and saw it, all of that. Like, it's one thing to hear about it, but to actually experience something that dark and like that, yeah. a situation that fucking bad. I can't yeah. imagine. I bet if I was one of the officers, I would quit. I, I would just like walk in a quick second. I see all that. I'm out. Like, h- how could you do like go through that? H.H. H. Holmes was a scary individual. That's for sure. Nine murders were verified by investigators. While waiting trial for murder, he actually wrote an autobiography, Holmes' own story. He sold it to the Hearst Corporation for $10,000. The New York World newspaper published his columns and paid him $7,500 for his confession. And Holmes continued to be wildly inconsistent. While behind bars, he said he was turning into the devil, saying, I was born with the devil in me. And he also raised a chicken and kept it as a pet while in prison. He was tried in Philadelphia for the murder of Benjamin Pitzel. And for over a year, investigators gathered the information for the trial. And the defense had less than a month to prepare. After his lawyers quit, Holmes decided to represent himself, which is usually a huge mistake for defendants, but he was actually surprisingly good at it. His lawyers eventually came back to help. Carrie actually testified against Holmes in his trial, and her testimony was so moving that it brought everyone in the room to tears. Georgiana, now knowing she wasn't his legal wife, also testified against Holmes. Her testimony was cold and callous, and by the end, Holmes was sobbing. But then he pulled himself together to cross-examine her, which was quite a spectacle. Ultimately, though, H.H. Holmes was convicted of murder in 1895, which he tried to appeal and claimed an insanity defense, but that did not work out for him at all. As he was sentenced to death by hanging by the court of Philadelphia, and he was hanged on May 7th, 1896, a week before his 35th birthday. His Chicago hotel was briefly remodeled as a tourist attraction and named the Holmes Horror Castle, but a fire destroyed everything inside right before it opened. And the structure remained there until 1938 when it was torn down to build a post office. So was Holmes a serial killer who found joy in torture, pain, and murder? Or was he an opportunist who murdered people to get them out of his way? And I think a little bit of both probably. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, he murdered children and entire families. Whether he did it for enjoyment, money, convenience, or all three, there's no doubt he was a monster. A lot of the details that we know today are from newspapers like the New York World and others that publish the shocking stories of Holmes and his murder castle. The 1895 article, The Castle of Modern Bluebeard, provided maps of the castle and detailed how Holmes lured people in to their deaths. And there's a prominent theory out there that Holmes was never executed. Instead, he used his great wealth to bribe the police who hung another man in his place. And he actually escaped. In March of 2017, the great-grandson of H.H. Holmes, Jeff Mudgett, had his remains exhumed for DNA testing. When archaeologists at the University of Pennsylvania dug up the grave, they found a fake pine box. And underneath a few feet deeper, they found a body encased in cement, which Holmes requested for his burial. 
and it took a lot of effort to crack open the cement, but they found a man's skeleton and a skull that miraculously still had a brain in it. Jeff was a witness and said chills went up and down my spine. To see that skeleton and that skull with the brain still inside, which is a phenomenon that scientists still have not explained, scared the hell out of me. Two months of DNA analysis and dental records showed the remains belonged to H.H. H. Holmes, and this proved that he was buried in the grave, but it doesn't prove when. Jeff Mudgett is also convinced that H.H. H. Holmes is Jack the Ripper. Jeff and a former CIA analyst, Amaris Fox, investigated the theory for a docuseries called American Ripper. Like Holmes, Jack the Ripper was a patient killer who opted for torture over gore. He choked his victims to death and then dissected them methodically, killing quietly making sure he was never caught. Jack the Ripper very likely had at least some medical training based on how he dissected the bodies. So investigators followed a trail of documents to track the movement of Holmes for his entire adult life. But the trail mysteriously stops between 1888 and 1889, the same time that Jack the Ripper was terrorizing London. Shortly after the last known killing by Jack the Ripper, a passenger traveling under the name H. Holmes took a ship from the UK to the United States. Investigators also studied a letter sent to the London media by Jack the Ripper called the Dear Boss Letter, and the analysis of that letter showed that the writer was American, and a forensic sketch of Jack the Ripper based on the testimony from 13 witnesses looks eerily similar to that of H.H. Holmes. Yeah, definitely very similar. I mean, the mustache, everything. Which is wild, because Jack the Ripper is still, we still don't know for sure who who that killer was. And I think there is definitely a good amount of probability that H.H. Holmes could have, in fact, been Jack the Ripper. Interesting. So Jack the Ripper has remained anonymous. We don't know who his identity is. We'll have to do an episode on Jack the Ripper, too. Yeah, definitely. Very interesting one. I mean, the the, just the brutalness of the crimes and just Mm -hmm. the fact that this person was never caught is, is truly crazy after all these years. And it's, and it's interesting how many like similar characteristics and the way they, they did their things were. Yeah. Um, The killings are very much similar. I mean, clearly they've had some sort of medical experience in order to dissect the bodies and mutilate in order to pull out the organs and uh things like that. And an attorney actually went on record to say that if Holmes were still alive today, that they could arrest him for the killings based on the sketch alone. So they would arrest him for being Jack the Ripper, just based on the mere fact that their identities line up so much and i mean they definitely look similar i don't know if it's exactly the same yeah but definitely some similarities there for sure i'd say like an 80 90 percent match as far as appearance goes but at the end of the day hh H. holmes will definitely go down as one of america's first serial killers i mean it was really the first time in american history where a killer like this was making national headlines and obviously killing as many people as he did and in the way that he did Uh, is still, I mean, extremely creepy and eerie to think about. And reason why this story has been made into a number of different books and movies and documentaries. And actually, I know that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio actually bought film rights to this story, The Devil in the White City. And supposedly there was supposed to be a movie that came out a year or two ago it hasn't come out yet so i don't know i'm hoping they're still working on it but Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like leonardo dicaprio will play hh holmes in the devil in the white city which nice that would be a a good ass movie absolutely i mean anything with leo in it is i was gonna say he's one of my favorite actors oh yeah so good hands down like my favorite for sure every movie he's in is i mean wolf of wall street the revenant so many movies he's in he's just like he becomes that character So I know that he would become H.H. Holmes extremely well. I mean, he'd have that charm and that cleverness and that obviously handsome guy. Like he would play that role extremely well. So I hope they make that movie because I I know when you told me about it, I was ecstatic because of like, yeah, for H.H. Holmes, this would be be a scary ass fucking movie. Like, and you know, when you have Leonardo DiCaprio, like the film crew and and the production quality is going to be be on fucking top notch. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so, they actually come out with this movie because it'd be interesting to kind of see this story played out in a in a film like that. Absolutely. I feel like it really, you know, it's one thing to hear these stories and listen to these stories, but it's another to actually visually watch mm-hmm. what actually these people went through. I mean, these poor people that were his victims. 
uh, you know, Benjamin even like, obviously he was a criminal, but he mm-hmm. didn't deserve to be murdered and have his kids murdered. Like, no, H.H. H. Holmes was just a savage and it was just all about him at the end of the day. It didn't matter who, you know, I, I think he was an opportunist and he saw, you know, opportunities to further himself and his life and get more money and wealth. And in order to do that, he was willing to take whoever's life he needed to because mm-hmm. he knew he could, he knew he could get away with it. He knew how to manipulate yeah. the system. He definitely felt like he was smarter than everybody. I mean, it's, it's a lot of the similar traits that other serial killers have. If you think about definitely. it, definitely it's very similar of this. Like I I'm too smart for the police. I'm not going to get caught. I'm powerful. People are scared of me. You know, and on top of that, H.H. H. Holmes had the wealth. He had the money. Yeah. And during this time period in history, I mean, if you had that money, you could basically do whatever you want. And so that's what he did. For sure. And out of all the serial killers we've covered so far, H.H. H. Holmes, to me, is like one of the most darkest individuals I've ever yeah. heard about. Right. Like, Well, the fact that he would, you know, lure people into his hotel and then he would creepily watch them yeah like, right through peepholes and stuff as they're dying and, stuff. and how you mentioned i do get a lot of the similar vibes as the the saw movies yeah and, it's uh, very the torture chambers and all of that and i'll bet you anything that those movies, movies took a are, lot of inspiration from yeah. this story i mean with the I whole see that. traps in the rooms and obviously differences in hh H. holmes hotel you ain't getting out even if you figure out a way to get out you know like oh very true once you're in there you're never going to come out again and that's where your your final resting place will be. The, this this is like my absolute nightmare. It is, <laughs> like it, yeah. holy shit, a torturous murder castle. Good God, it's all of our nightmares. And yeah, thank God they tore this shit down because this place would be haunted oh, beyond I belief. Bet. Like I bet. I wonder if if uh, the post office is like haunted on this ground. Even like, yeah, anything on this in the same land or same area, I could see that. Or if any of his properties are haunted, I'm big curious to know. Mm-hmm. if anybody knows about that but that is basically the story of hh H. holmes and his murder castle also known as devil in the white city but hopefully you found this episode of lights out podcast interesting intriguing individuals like this always just intrigue me i find it very interesting to go through their stories in extensive detail and, and figure out you know kind of what makes these people tick and hh H. holmes is just one of those that i think is you know kind of set above the rest in a lot of ways i think there's a lot of serial killers i think it's very it's a lot more obvious to understand why you know why they did the things they did there were specific things in their life and obviously he did not have a a great upbringing but at the same time i think it was interesting that this kind of all started with that trauma he went through with the skeleton like if he hadn't actually had those experiences with that skeleton right. would hh H. holmes have ended up being a serial killer you mm-hmm. know, and, kill. and then obviously into all that dissecting at such an early age yeah and that was like his favorite thing to do it seems like yeah that which, was red flag as i wonder well. if schools even really do i know schools are not doing like human dissection but yeah but i, I, did I like, don't think they do anymore correct us if we're wrong but um you know when i was younger in middle school i i dissected like a cow eyeball or something for a science yeah experiment. like i've done a frog before yeah but not nothing that's not like, like a full blown animal that no, he was doing. No, he was doing dogs and all kinds of creatures. So, mm-hmm. and it's interesting how you see do see that that commonality in other serial killers of dissecting and and killing animals and things like that before oh, they yeah. move on to people. So, <laughs> a lot of them have that in common. Yeah, yeah, they start there, I guess. Yep, and then they work their way for, up from there. But mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a it's a truly terrifying story, and uh, yeah. Hopefully you found this one interesting, but we'll go ahead and wrap up today here. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. If you enjoyed it, we'd really appreciate it if you go and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. It does really help out the show. I know so many of you love the the visual version on YouTube, and I totally, totally get that. But if you are only watching on YouTube, take a minute, go over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Even if you're a Spotify person, hit follow, hit subscribe. That does help us out. And as always, I just want to remind you to follow us on Twitter and Instagram because, yeah, we do post all of our show updates there at Lights Out Cast. But until next time, lights out, everybody. <laughs>